language can be your best friend for learning or it can be the best weapon of destruction in a way. Hello, and welcome back to another Mind Matters show. In the studio with me today is Harrison Keeley, Adam Daniels, and with us this week is Chu Barambwam, who is a friend of ours and who we have been following recently because of a fairly interesting line of research and um, and interest that that she has been pursuing. Uh, but before we get into that, Chu, uh, if you could just let us know a little bit about yourself and um, maybe your background in language um, and uh, where you've um, where you've studied and and what what interests you so much about language. Mm -hmm. um, well, first, thanks for having me. And um, I, uh, I was born in Argentina, but uh, went to live in France when I was 18. Uh, so that's 22 years ago, almost. Uh, it's a long time. And I, um, I studied linguistics in France. So I was, always, I was already interested in languages. In fact, um, well, I was almost trilingual already back when I first arrived in France. Uh, so I was always passionate about language, really. Which languages? And about sounds. Which, uh, well, I have, uh, my mother tongue is Spanish. Um, I learned English at school since the age of eight. And then French from the age of 15, 16. Okay. And then I took on Chinese and Russian in later years and Danish. Uh, so that's where I, th those are kind of weaker. Um, but um, yeah, well, I speak French and Spanish like I speak English. And uh, yeah, I was always interested in languages. In fact, I was a bit traumatized by sounds and probably that's what made me want to learn sounds because till the age of four, many children have this problem. Till the age of four, I couldn't pronounce the rrr in Spanish. Mm. You know, the rrr that you guys maybe have trouble with. Mm. Yeah, I still can't pronounce uh, it, don't worry. <laughs> okay, well, I still remember the day when I was four years old and I finally say the word bird, which is very difficult, pájaro. And, uh, and my dad smiling, bravo, finally. <laughs> so I think I got scarred from that. And then uh, since then, I always focused a lot, a lot on sounds. And for some reason, they appealed to me. It's like, until I know the sounds and until I pronounce things correctly, uh, I don't feel like I know the language or that I can know the people who speak the language. And of course, everybody's different in that sense. Many people prefer to keep their accent. I'm kind of always mm -hmm. striving to sound as close as possible. Uh, to a native speaker. And then um, at university, I studied linguistics and it was very general. So these things that I spoke about on my, on my videos uh, are things that I've always wanted to study, but there's hardly any books on the topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm kind of trying to, to put it out there to see what's, if there's an interest and, um, and if people are interested in discovering more about it because it's really um, almost a taboo in linguistics. Hmm. I, I learned all the, all the standard the mainstream theories, and it was interesting, but it doesn't explain language, in my opinion. So I'm still trying to figure out what language is, frankly. Well, uh, what's interesting to me, um, right off the bat, and if I didn't mention this before, uh, Chu, you have a channel on YouTube called Language with Chu, mm -hmm. where you've been delving into um, some of these questions that you have and some of these uh, very interesting um, lines of inquiry that uh, I know for me, you know, I, you, you speak language, you write language, and you read it all the time, but it's this rather ubiquitous uh, thing that we swim in and take largely for granted, and yet uh, there is so little that we can do without its use. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, this has, for me, been an opportunity to not only take a step back from what, uh, from, from this, this tool that we have, which is incredible, uh, but to also think about it in a very different way. Um, and before we get into that, I just wanted to add that uh, Russian, learning Russian and Chinese in addition to 
uh, knowing your mother tongue and English and French. I mean, these are very different languages. Chinese in particular has a whole, I mean, it's not even, I know that Russian sort of resembles uh, the, the, the letters of the alphabet in the Western uh, languages, but Chinese is something altogether uh, almost alien uh, in a way. And, um, and so that kind of makes you, uh, that even gives you a, a broader scope from which to look at language. Um, and so I don't know if there's anything to, uh, that you might want to say about that particular point, but uh, I found it very interesting that you, you know, these are very different looking languages and sounding languages. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but uh, the thing is that uh, I'm not the best polyglot in the world either. And there's people who speak 20 languages, for example, 30 sometimes. Uh, the problem, in my opinion, with most of them is that they're never linguists. And if you ask in a room full of linguists who speaks more than one language, you'll get zero <laughs> hands being raised or very few, you know. Mm. So there's that there's that distance that, uh, you know, people like me or people who are really interested in learning languages, but also in language, the capacity for language, try to figure out. And yeah, you, will, you would need a lot more really to understand like the full complexity of language. Like I would need to know a language from, you know, Africa and a Semitic language and things like that still escape my, my set of skills, mm -hmm. but yeah, Chinese expands a lot because, and also because it's one of the, um, the uh, languages that we have traces from, from the past. So it kind of, it gives clues about how thought affects language and vice versa. It gives clues about how language may have originated, at least in some parts of the world. So, yeah, it's fascinating to actually be able to use it as a tool for that. Um, in small detail, sometimes you discover that the more, if you learn, if you expand and add a language, uh, recently, for example, I was reading about Sumerian, a very, very old language. And the more I read about it, the more I realize that it resembles Chinese. Um, and if you, if I didn't know Chinese, I wouldn't have noticed that. So yeah, it's definitely a plus, but not enough to really understand the whole subject. Well, that creates a, a definite problem, uh, which doesn't, that just doesn't make sense to me that you could be a linguist because if you're a linguist, you're interested in languages and then not, uh, engage with the very thing that you're studying. Yeah. How do they do it? Like what, uh. I don't know any professional linguists, so, yeah. so well, this is the impression, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, just let me tell you, like, um, the impression I've had from reading books by, for example, Bible scholars or, or kind of related subjects where they, they know ancient Greek, they may, maybe, they know Latin, but it doesn't seem like they would able to, to be able to actually converse in that language, right? And when you see, when you, when you hear them pronouncing the words, it's it's obvious that they're they're just pronouncing the words that they've memorized that they've seen on the page. At least that's the impression that I have. Is that kind of something similar with linguists, in your experience, or um, how does it work? Yeah, but it didn't used it didn't used to be actually. I would say that it's changed in the fifties. A linguist used to be, for the most part, somebody who went to a strange land, and without understanding any of the language, they sat. They went to live in a tribe, for example. And uh, and without any translator, like we have nowadays, it's much more easier, much, much easier. Sorry. Uh, they used to have to figure out the language from scratch by saying, mm -hmm. OK. Pen, you know, mm -hmm. paper, no, 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 and build up from that. Right. Until they ended up learning the language over years and writing the grammar so that those languages wouldn't go extinct. Uh, that's what. Uh, a lot of linguists were doing at the time or figuring out the sound system, why the sounds were different, why there were tonal languages in one part of the world and not in others, etc. Since the 50s, it started being a very academic field. So basically linguists are mostly behind their computers and they don't go out there. And if you want to make a thesis on the preposition to in English, you can become a linguist. You see, so you don't need... You don't need other languages necessarily mm -hmm. to become a linguist nowadays. Yeah, yeah, and I um, guess for a I'm lot of linguists, of course, there's yeah, a, a lot of linguists maybe just study or just study their own language, 
is there like a, a subset of field, like uh, people who study just English and things about English and then multiple languages or just different languages? Like, are those kind of different fields? Or? Yeah. Or they would focus more on one theory of language. Does language acquisition uh, matter more than uh, whether language is innate, for example, mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. Or uh, does grammar in, they do comparative linguistics, so for that you mm -hmm. need to learn another language. Uh, yeah. Does the grammar, how does the grammar in English differ from French grammar or something? Mm -hmm. But in general, it's very, I find that it's, it's become a lot more restrictive in that sense. A lot of people do uh, computational linguistics and things that are purely theoretical, uh, not really in the field. Of course, there still are really good people, really good linguists who go out there and, and compare 20 different languages and stuff, but I'd say they're far in between nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what then, um, okay, so that kind of gives us a, an overview of uh, the linguistic field. Um, and in your, on your channel, on your YouTube channel, you've been, you've had this series where you've, uh, been discussing, uh, kind of link, well, yeah, some linguistic theories that were, um, or that are, uh, very obscure, even within linguistics. Um, so do you mind giving us a little bit of an overview of what those are compared to, you know, what you just talked about? Sure. Well, uh, there's one thing that is never spoken about in linguistics and it's, or hardly ever, is that uh, is the question of whether sounds have meaning. Because usually we assume that the, the, we call it the sign, the word is arbitrary, right? So some people decided that they would name um, one thing a table, another one a bottle, etc. And when you ask, well, do sounds have meaning? Most linguists would say, well, it's impossible because if sounds have, have meaning, then why uh, why is um, book book in English, but book in Chinese is shu? Mm -hmm. If the sounds in themselves had meaning, then it doesn't make sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, then other people would say, well, if you're imitating something from nature, or the uh, the intrinsic value or essence of things uh, via sounds, then again, all languages should be the same, because why? That would mean uh, that my culture by naming uh, I don't know tree arbol is uh, has a right and your culture because it named it tree it has it wrong mm -hmm. right we should all be naming same the same things in the same way if sound had meaning so what i wanted to point out in the in this uh, in these videos is that it's not so clear cut because it depends on how you define meaning and even language i think um and there's there's so many uh, similarities between languages which are said to not be connected at all that it's a mystery. It's a real mystery. Nobody knows why words in Chinese or Japanese will resemble something in Portuguese. I don't know. While the families, you know, those trees, you know, uh, Latin leads to Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, or old Proto-Germanic leads to uh, Germanic, English, etc. Mm -hmm. Those are taken as the truth. But if that's what, if that's the case, then where do all these similarities come from? And I just focus on sounds. But the same would apply to grammatical structures, I think. Um, I'm going to develop that on, on a future series of videos because there's many, many similarities that are across languages that are miles and miles apart of peoples who are never in contact. So if there's not something meaningful in sound or in the way uh, each culture structures their grammar, then please explain why. You know, and that's mm -hmm. the question that uh, linguistics usually avoids. You know, well, it's innate, and that came a lot with in the fifties, also with uh, Noam Chomsky. Uh, he decided to describe everything as a computer, practically, and it became the science, the linguistics, which is supposed to be a science. It became a dogma, and everything that if you if you criticize that, then you're called a charlatan, or you're not you're told you're not scientific enough, but yet you have so much evidence that there's something uh, common to many, many languages um, and almost um, of which we have very few traces nowadays that, you, in my opinion, you shouldn't ignore it. But, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do in these videos, basically uh, show several theories that did bring this topic up mm -hmm. to show that it's not just one crazy linguist who came up with this, but several who are saying, okay, Several let me see, things. if I just look at English, 
Never a language, crazy language. Uh, if I just look at English, I see things, I see words that end up with the same sounds, even though if I look at the roots of the words, each of them come from a different language, supposedly. Um, I gave an example on the videos, for example, uh, uh, with the uh, sequence of sounds S T R, right? And you have linear things, you have a string, a street, it's all a line, right? Many words in English will group into that category. And then you have words with app, AP, app, uh, flat, lap, words like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all group like that. But if you look at each of them into in, on the dictionary, you'll see that one comes from Celtic, the other one from Germanic, from Proto-European, from Proto this, Proto that. Proto just means that we are guessing because there's no written records of that language, right? Mm -hmm. So you end up with that. And then um, if you combine the two sequences of sounds, you end up with, with the word strap, which combines those meanings, line mm -hmm. and flat. It's a band, right? So mm -hmm. uh, that's just an example, but there's many, many, many. Uh, across languages and within just one language alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I mentioned uh, other theories where there's um, there seems to be almost like a, um, you get a sense that you're you're in a language of dreams, a symbology, uh, and each word is telling you a little piece of that um, um, of the way each culture re uh, sees reality. So it so it would mean that. It's not that one culture is right or wrong, like I said before, but that each culture chooses um, to, to view reality in a certain way and to use certain sounds that convey that sort of essence, subtle meaning mm -hmm. of whatever they're describing. Sure. I wonder... What's about it, about the videos? Uh... <laughs> okay, yeah, well. I've, got a, I've got a few things to say and questions, uh, but first, the, just the last thing you said made me think of um, nerds who create their own languages like J.R.R. Tolkien or, you know, the, the people that created the, the languages in, or there were a few move, a few movies recently where they created entirely, or like Game of Thrones. Um, there were, there are so in, in the entertainment industry, there are people that create languages, right? I wonder if, um, so just something that came to mind is I wonder if looking at the created language is if you could learn something about like the psychology of the person who created the language um, I guess it would depend on how mathematical they were in creating it. Like maybe they were following like linguistic rules and, or, or theories to, to come up with a the like a, a possible language that could exist in some fantastical context, or if maybe subconsciously they were, they're actually engaging in a similar process that, that happens when through in the creation of language, that there's almost like a, an emotional appeal to, to a certain combination of of phonemes or sounds and how they get put together and then the words that they actually create. So, um, so yeah, it would be interesting to see if any of these theories like actually map onto these <laughs> newly created languages and, and, and yeah. you would be able to know like, okay, this person did this in this way, like Tolkien as an example, I don't know how he did it, but if uh, he had his own strict set of rules that he was guiding himself by in order to create that language, if he was still, uh, if he was still, you know, following these like unconscious right. motives or drives. Because like the, the people who create art or c create languages like this, they're artists in a sense. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so if they're going to create a language, just say mathematically, there's going to come come a point where they say, well, that just doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. Right. So what they're, what they're going for is something that actually sounds like a language and they're going to be using their aesthetic sense to, to get a feel for, well, that just that works and that doesn't work right and that's a very mm -hmm. mysterious process mm -hmm. in and of itself is what works and what doesn't work and that so that leads me to to what you were saying about uh, i think you might have been alluding to one of the examples from your videos about the like the name of a place and the name of a place it had these different syllables that using this one theory about the meaning of individual sounds gave this very accurate description of the place and so the a, a few ideas we got cr created languages the, the places that with names that match the, 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 the features of the, the place. And then the third one was um, what you said about you have all these related or seemingly related words in their meanings that come from allegedly come from different languages. <clears throat> well, what came to mind immediately when, when you said that was, well, maybe there, maybe both are true in the sense that even if they, even if the linguists are correct in their hypothesis that this word came from that language, 
it's again, it's the selection process that, that's that's important. Well, maybe that word got that word got remembered and got put into use because it was the perfect word for their purpose, right? And that's again mm -hmm. that artistic sense of, oh well, that works. And the question is, well, why does it work? Well, okay, so let me go step by step for the uh, for the last part. Um, I believe it was Bloomberg uh, in uh, I can't remember when, but anyway, he said that um, sounds have their own life, uh, their own uh, meanings. Of course, when we talk about meaning in sounds, you can't say uh, the letter B means yellow, for example, because there's only 20 or 30 phonemes in each language. The sounds that each language chooses only 20 or 30. So obviously to describe everything we describe in language, they have to have a broad uh, several meanings and a broad range of meaning, right? Mm -hmm. But he said that once you get that, once you get the, the sound with this broad range of meaning, what happens is that um, there's almost like a, um, like they infiltrate new words. Unless they're really borrowed uh, from another language because of economical interests, because of uh, conquers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. When you create a new word or you uh, borrow a word to make it yours, naturally the sounds will gravitate the sounds that uh, in your language convey the essence of that new word uh, are the sounds that you will use. So if in if you take a word from another language that starts with a B and represents, um, I don't know, um, bulging things like in English, um, but in your language, bulging things start with a P, you're more like you're likely to actually make it into a similar word, but with a P because you, you want to keep that essence in your, in the, the meaning of the word you're borrowing, but that the essence that pertains to your language. Mm -hmm. So I believe there's something like that going on. It's like, yes, there is etymology and there is a history of words, but when you talk about phonetic shifts and changes, it probably could be something akin to what um, Margaret Magnus says in her book, uh, the, uh, the, word, the Words in the God, I think it's called. I mentioned it on, on my videos um, where, yeah, it's like, um, it's like contagion, contagion from sounds. Mm -hmm. I don't know if mm -hmm. that's clear. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then uh, about creative languages, I'd say uh, there's two kinds because well, Tolkien was probably a genius and he probably, I don't know, he could have picked up something about the way, uh, what sounds really, really conveyed um and you but there's also the fictional part where you see uh i don't know the elves have a very melodic kind of language while mm -hmm. the evil guys will sound more guttural yeah. more with the throat ha, 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 right mm -hmm. so there's something in sounds themselves that mm -hmm. could be uh actually could be indicative of the, the trait psychological traits right that he was picking up on but he also developed a whole grammar etc but on the other extreme you see uh, created languages like esperanto and it wasn't successful at all. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that is? I have <laughs> no, no idea. No one liked it? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't sound good? Well, the thing is, take Tolkien. He had a whole world created, right? And the psychology of the people and the history of the people and the, their lives and everything. It, it's like he could feel the language or, or live it. You take his Peranto, it's a puzzle, it's a... It's chunks of Spanish with chunks of Italian with chunks of English with chunks. It belongs to nobody. There's no culture. There's no, no soul. It's not to rooted it. in anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's okay. no, there's no soul to it. So I don't think it would stick um, mm -hmm. for a language to be creative or, or uh, useful. It has to really represent uh, the culture or the, the soul yeah. of the people, if you want the. Uh... Okay. So, um, and this is where I think, uh, it, it gets really interesting too, because on one hand, um, you're, you're working within a very kind of rigorous scientific, uh, study, and you're also reaching, um, in a positive sense, you're, you're kind of expanding your view and trying to get at what is, um, and this may not be the, the best word to describe it, but what is uh, archetypal about language what is uh so intrinsic about language that it goes it has even deeper roots and deeper uh resonances than we've been led to think perhaps and 
uh, one of the approaches that you get into, um, which I love and, and which uh, I think got me thinking along a couple of lines, or at least the beginnings of it, was particles. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, you know what, rather than me uh, outline your, your bit about particles, you probably you're going to do it about 100 times better. Mm-hmm. Um, Take it away. <laughs> but uh, please... If, if you can well it's just that it occurred to me that you know in in um, biology uh, in physics we look at atoms and molecules and you know particles and and a couple of few you know a couple of handfuls of um, atoms form anything that is material in this world right and then you have uh, in biology you have the uh, molecules that form proteins and so on and so forth and genes and we know how complex life is right but it all comes from those 20 basic amino acids. And there's an analogy, as simplistic as it may be, with language, where each language is using basically an average of 20 sounds, Mm -hmm. and yet creating a complexity of language that is not evolutionary possible. Um, um, I can can expand on that actually um, a little bit, and it's when I mean it's not evolutionary possible is that... um, you can say there's many theories, right? There's a theory that we come from that uh, we started with grunts. Language started with grunts, right? Grunts, right? Ooh, 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 hmm. ah, whatever, it's right? Obvious truth. Explain to me obvious. how. Yeah, explain to me how that became uh, the Russian grammar. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. Um, there's other uh, uh, theories that says well, it became uh, it started because people were working together instead of saying. Instead of one on one, they needed to send a message to everybody. Hey, can you come and help me or whatever? So they needed language to do that. And they started with sounds, emotional sounds, et cetera. And, um, and kind of like the uh, like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, you know, when they sing together and while they're hope. working. I, I hope. hope. I hope. Exactly. <laughs> Again, explain to me how from that we came to the subjunctive, for example, or, you know, pl- present perfect in English or whatever complex thing it, there is. There's also the fact that if the theory is correct and men uh, spread out from Africa, it would be the most amazing case of parallel evolution, meaning that people who never uh, met each other again, mm-hmm. you know, some went there, some went there, da, 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 ended up with exactly the same capacity for language. If you take a child from uh, Korea and um and he or she goes to live in the U.S. from infancy, he'll learn or she'll learn English perfectly, right? There is no, uh, no difference among, um, amongst people in terms of the language capacity. So it would be amazing that given different environments, different uh, cultural settings uh, and everything, language would have evolved so uh, perfectly, mm-hmm. so equally amongst people. Mm-hmm. And also, there's no evolutionary advantage to uh, to using things that are complex in language, like uh, the, the the I don't know the I just borrowed the spear which had broken after uh, Bob here uh, dropped it on the ground. Those are those are what Chomsky made language all about recursion, where you where you can put chunks of sentences one after the other. Or or Harrison said. Um, this is interesting. Adam said that Harrison said that this is interesting, right? That's recursion in language. According to Chomsky, that's the only character, the main characteristic that makes language this innate kind of computational system. Never mind that they spend 50 years trying to find it in the brain and they can't. So there's, there's so many things that don't, uh, add up. I mean, I could go on and on about, uh, language and evolution, but, um, it just doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. There's something archetypal, like is to bring back, bring it back to your question. There's something um, um, almost as if people in the past uh, were using both hemispheres: the left one, the most logical one, which is supposedly where language resides uh, in modern times, and uh, and the right one more equally. Mm-hmm. And sounds to me give me that um, get that impression. You know, synergy. Where um, I know what's it called? Synesthetic. Where where the person uh, com- the senses are a bit scrambled. Synesthesia. Synesthesia. Synesthesia, sorry. Yeah. Synesthesia, yeah. That's it. Um, where people see sounds or smell colors or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, sounds have a bit of that 
mm-hmm. resemble a little bit that if you if you imagine that it's that a sound from way back when or that people pick up from somewhere because they say I want to call this you know using certain sounds they're picking up on that on that something that is not necessarily tangible or doesn't come from a dictionary so I don't know the answer mm-hmm. but I think there's something is yes, ar- archetypal yeah. or or that brings uh, roots from uh, that has traces from a very very far uh, a past yeah. Mm-hmm. very very long ago mm-hmm. yeah i've got th- i want to say something about the evolution because <clears throat> like i haven't uh i mean i i took a an introductory psychology course maybe two i don't know when i went to university so we had a very a very short you know introduction to some of the theories about language um as a as a kind of innate capacity so i don't i don't know all the details i'm not well read in linguistics at all but um, but one of the things that that strikes me as interesting and strange is that, like you mentioned, if if some of these theories are true about how language developed, then you have this remarkable example of um, like what's it called divergent evolution or parallel ev- evolution of these very similar traits. But what that so what those things seem to suggest is that humans have um, like what I think Chomsky says a capacity for language, like, and I think that's that's mm-hmm. pretty pretty much like universally accepted now that's part of human nature is that capacity for language and when we look at that capacity we see how complex it is because our 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 linguistic um avenues can just be infinitely complex like you mentioned but i th- i believe it's also true that there is a window of learning when you're a child for for learning a language you have to be exposed to the language and if that if you get past that window without learning it i'm I'm not sure if it's impossible, but I think it, I think it is if, yeah, but almost. Or, yeah. Okay. So, so that seems to, that's, that's a problem that has to be worked out because if language developed, then it had to have developed presumably by humans in their adulthood who are trying to communicate with each other, oh. who have passed their linguistic, like imprinting stage. And like, so that would, that would seem to suggest to me well, it, a few things. One would that would be that um, maybe using an evolutionary theory, it, it was just a very long process, right? Because we've missed that window, so maybe we developed a little bit of language, and then we taught that to children, and then so so then the next generation had that capacity, and then expanded on that capacity, and it, it got com- more complex and more complex and more complex. But the implication of that is still that at the very root, humanity had all that capacity to begin with and it hadn't it just hadn't developed yet and so that so that's a conundrum too because why would humans have this this untapped capability how would how would how would that evolutionary develop that uh evolutionarily develop it's like oh we just um evolution just happened to they accidentally create this this magnificent capacity that didn't actually get used for anything for the longest period of time, so served no evolutionary value. And then some people just happened to figure out that they could make sounds have meaning. And then over time, that capacity rounded itself out until now we have language. It just seems like a completely ridiculous story, um, which suggests to me, like the, the, the most obvious or like logical conclusion that I can think of is that, well, humanity was designed to have that, ca- that, capacity to begin with and that maybe uh, maybe there are maybe there are multiple pass- pathways to then um utilize that capacity um but we so what it comes down to is that we just don't know how how that first language started because how do you teach the the first baby's language if you don't have language yourself so d- do you have any thoughts on um like have you thought about what that first language might have been like or how it came to be have you ever like just wondered? Well, yes, I do wonder about it all the time. But the um, uh, there's two conflicting theories, and I think both of them are wrong. One is uh, take somebody like Terence Deacon, for example. Uh, he's a microbiologist, I believe, and he thinks that language started because um, it's innate, yes, but uh, because just like humans used to produce vitamin C in their bodies before they one day they figured out that they could pick up fruit from the trees so they didn't need it anymore so let's ditch the vitamin c production now our bodies don't produce it anymore it's because we are smarter in that sense we get an outside there's something from the outside that can 
uh, provide the body what, what it needs, right? And he extrapolates that to um, to a language by saying, well, in the beginning, maybe it was grunts or gestures or whatever, but the more uh, human beings became social, the more they figured out they could learn it from the mother, the, the community, et cetera, right? And they learned, that's why you have a uh, period of imprinting where you need to learn the language from your parents. But once again, um, that doesn't explain the first people, the first mother who spoke to her child and mm -hmm. how the child figured out, okay, I don't need to start speaking on my own. I'll learn it from mom, right? So this is a theory, I think. The second theory, Chomsky, he says that there was a famous, uh, one of our ancestors, Prometheus, he calls him, uh, suddenly was born with a gene for language. Now, when you're talking about a gene for language, it would have to be a massive, massive impossible to fathom mutation, right? And then this guy was all alone. He couldn't talk to anybody, but because the populations were so reduced in number, don't, don't ask me about inbreeding or whatever, they, uh, he passed it on to his children and the children to their children. And then suddenly language emerged. Again, who taught it to who? How did it begin? Nobody, nobody brings um, questions, mm -hmm. those things, right? You brought, uh, you brought up the idea that it was designed, and I can't see it any other way, frankly. I don't know how it first uh, came into being, but I do know that many cultures, now today they're seen as myths, but if you take, for example, the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon runes or the Rig Veda, you know, very old systems, uh, for them it was second nature to think that a sound represented something, a connection to their gods, to a higher reality or something. The runes are an alphabet from 150 BC, for example, and they um, you hardly see a horizontal trait in it. It's always vertical traits and spikes, and it looks like arrows in the sky. And you know, and they said, you know, this is our connection to the sky. So whatever these people were seeing in the sky, or and we know how history has disguised uh, cometary events, for example, um, throughout the entire history that we know of. Um, what if they were seeing some kind of phenomena and hearing some kind of sounds or whatever that actually made them want to develop the communication systems we have now? Or what if for them, a sound had a lot more meaning in terms of a spiritual connection that we've lost nowadays? The famous Om, the Vedic Om, mm -hmm. is uh, supposed to mean God and connect you to blah, blah, blah. I mean, I don't know all the details, but... Uh, is not new. The idea that sounds uh, and language uh, would have a relationship to um, to something more transcendental is not a new idea. In the beginning was the word. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. Mm -hmm. How did it start? Well, I don't know, but I know that the, the Babel myth is, uh, do you say Babel or Babel? Babel. Both? Babel. I, I said tomato. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Babel myth is confusing because uh, in the first part of Genesis, you have, and they spoke several languages and they had several cultures, blah, blah, blah. Then it jumps and said, and God became angry and, and they spoke one language and God became angry and boom, there, the, there goes the tower. Except that you just said that they spoke several languages. So there's a problem there. I don't think, I mean, it's clear that people already spoke many languages. Oh, to me. So Chu, you're you you like the you know the lights are going off a little bit here <laughs> because um well just just a quick and then I'd like to speak more to uh this intelligent design dimension. Um the way that language is being misused right now in Western culture, the way yeah. it's the way words are being um appropriated to describe exactly opposite of what they are is the, the Tower of Babel is these people uh, suffering from a confusion of the tongues. Um, so just needed to blurt that out because it, it just seems like such an important thing to recognize uh, when we're when we're reading or or uh, consuming uh, media and information. Um, but but one concept that uh, that we were covering. Um, in our discussions of intelligent design previously was this idea of irreducible complexity mm -hmm. in biology, uh, which is simply the idea that, you know, you have so many components, for instance, in a, in a cell or even just a part of a cell 
that could not have possibly randomly um, and gradually and gradually over time uh, associated themselves with the other parts and and combined to form such a complicated mechanism that works in a very uh, specific, consistent and and complicated way. So uh, when Harrison, a few moments ago, you, you mentioned this difficulty in, you know, conceiving of how, um, you know, language could could evolve. I thought, my goodness, language is is maybe maybe many languages aren't as complex as they uh, as they are now. Maybe there there is some development in some cases, um, but uh, perhaps can we apply irreducible complexity and biology to the to language? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you have to start even from the beginning. What is language? It's not an easy word to define. What is language? Well, uh, one definition, <laughs> I have it written right down here. Uh, all languages and codes have four components, uh, an alphabet, grammar, meaning, and intent. Right, but that's, that's the characteristics. Okay. But if I ask you, what is language? It's a tool by which we use to communicate information. Okay. That's, not, that's definition number one. That's the one in the dictionary. Mm-hmm. But I ask you, how many times during lockdown, if anybody was alone in their house, apartment, whatever, did they actually talk to and with people? Mm-hmm. And does that mean that they stop using language? A person living out there alone in the mountains, do they stop using language? How about the symbolic representation of thoughts? Okay, then you're adding the, the thoughts. Uh-huh. And can you dissociate what is what thought is from what language is? Now, some people will say first came thought, so evolutionary, right? In in terms mm-hmm. of non irreducible complexity, first people were able to think. Now, explain to me how an Australopithecus could have traveled across the ocean or something to to be found for for fossils to be found in an island, for example, without talking. They just thought and they'll just build a boat because whatever, right? It's very mm-hmm. difficult to think without language. Yep. Some people will say that because that thought is more um, expansive or more, um, what's the word? Um, you can think without words to a certain extent and maybe babies do. Uh, and maybe we do when we look at an image or in a meditative state where you don't need words. You can't think without language. It's rare, mm-hmm. but you mm-hmm. can, right? And then they say, well, language constraints thought because when you speak you have to you depend on time you have to be linear you can't pronounce three vowels at the same time or three words at the same time Mm -hmm. right so they say well language constrains thoughts on the other hand maybe language organizes thought so thought and language to me are very very difficult to define and they go together Mm. that's one thing so which one evolved first and what why was it evolutionary advantageous when you could say well some people could have developed telepathy much more practical than having to be like, what do you mean? I don't understand. You know? Mm -hmm. So that's for the evolutionary part. But in terms of what language is, when you start, I don't know the definition either. (laughs) I'm trying to to, uh, figure it out. Um, But when I, uh, when I look at language, comparing them and everything, you can dissociate uh, the grammar, for example, from the uh, from pragmatics, which is the language in context, um, you need to know the situation to use language correctly. If I tell you whatever, um, do you know what time it is? You know I'm asking for the time, right? Mm-hmm. You could say yes, I do, but it would be a useless conversation, right? <laughs> yes. So you need the context. <laughs> so you need the con. So you need that. You need the sounds. You need all your vocal apparatus uh, and your hearing, which is amazing because that's, again, one thing that couldn't have mutated gradually. Um, people say, well, first we were able to breathe and eat and hear sounds, etc., And then suddenly language kind of got adapted into it, except that it's not evolutionary advantageous because our larynx is lower than in most animals and it makes us more prone to choking. So what's more important? Speaking or survival? 
it should be survival, right? Um, uh, there's a, there's a fact that we're limited. I mean, language is so perfect. It's like you, you could spend hours describing different aspects of language that could not have evolved, um, gradually. It's just like, uh, be he, Michael B. He says, for example, explained about, uh, irreducible complexity. I think mm -hmm. you can't have a complex ram grammar without complex thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or sounds without the vocal tract already yeah. uh, ready to pronounce them yeah so we it's not when we were talking about chomsky and evolution we mentioned this innate language capacity but it's not just some like module in your brain like language capacity it may be something like that or something in the the way that the mind the mind and the brain works but it's a whole combination of things you need you need your your throat parts to be in the right places and you need your mouth to be the right shape and you need to be able to hear certain frequencies and and probably even like it and you need a logical brain yeah so mm -hmm. you need all of these things to come together and to work to be able to have this thing this thing language um which is interesting i i want to i want to move from that into um transition a bit into something a bit philosophical um I read something that you shared, I think it was from, a, I don't know, an encyclopedia entry or something, and it was talking about um, some of these theories and these ideas of meaning in, in sounds, and there was a quote from, or uh, just a, a short summary of the, the thoughts of uh, the American pragma pragmatist philosopher uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, who, who talked about three levels of meaning, and it was a, it was a, I haven't read his work on this, I just saw this short summary, so I don't quite understand it, but he said there were th three levels. Um, three levels of meaning. It wasn't simply um, that you have the, the thing and then the representation of the thing. He said that it's more complex than that. That on the, on the first level, there's an iconic link between the two. So the thing, the sound is the thing in itself. And then the second level, which is the one I don't quite understand, um, was indexical. So this is when there's, it, it brings in an element of otherness. So the word or the, or the something represents um, something else. So he, uh, the, the person writing this entry gave the example of smoke being the representation of fire. So there are two related things, but not identical. And then the final one was the, the one with that had like the full level of arbitrariness, which would be symbolic. And um, so it's, it's not totally the same as the theories that you were mentioning, but there are elements that, that can be similar. Like, like if you take an iconic thing, like maybe there is a, there is a, a root meaning with certain syllables or sounds right and then it may get to the point where um once you have all these all these basic parts like your basic particles or your basic molecules then there may be uh, an added element of um of randomness or arbitrariness where um you might have a word that just doesn't quite work maybe because some academic you know made it up but but it were on the same thing with codes right you can take a, a dictionary assign every word in the dictionary a number, randomize them, send that dictionary to someone else, and then they'll have the, the they can speak in code, so it'll look like gibberish, but it will, it'll actually mean anything. So it wouldn't actually work as a spoken language, but because of the way that we, because of our intelligence, we're able to decode the, 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 the symbols from what they refer to, which in this case will be other words, which will then refer to meanings. So there's this, basically there's a lot of room for maneuvering in the way language is set up. But um, what Peirce was talking about is that, or and I, what I find most interesting is that basic level, right? And this is the, this is what you're talking about in your videos, that basic level of the sounds themselves. And there are a few interesting things that that come up. And well, first uh, just to stay on Peirce and, and psychology uh, or and philosophy, there's uh, something that uh, that Whitehead, another philosopher, argued about thought and about. Uh, well, about thought, he said that the root of well, the root of all experience, and therefore the root of all thinking too, is feeling. That everything, um, when you when if you can distill everything down, that it, it'll it'll result in feeling. And he 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 brought that down to the very basics of the universe, like the that the the root of experience itself would be the feeling of an atom or a particle, that energy. So any energetic event in physics, he equated energy with feeling. So whenever there was an energetic event in the in the universe in in the cosmos, that there was a feeling element of that as well, experiential. So this was a form of panpsychism. So every physical thing also had an experiential aspect to it, and that's 
his kind of explanation for the for how it's possible to, how the emergence of consciousness is possible is that consciousness is is part of the fundamental fabric of the universe. We have consciousness because everything has a degree of consciousness. And so when he when he's talking about the different layer the different levels of thinking and of, of thought, he would say that well, thoughts are just really complex feelings. So when we're when we're speaking or when we're, when we're thinking these like or writing difficult philosophical books, it's actually a, it's a combination and a, like a synthesis of very simple feelings. Uh, well, it's it's many things at this at, at once, but that's one level, and that seemed to me to be that it. I don't know if it's true, but it seems like it probably is true. Just just to my mind, because when you think about uh, babies, like babies have, like you were saying, they may be able to think to, to a certain degree without language. But what what are a baby's experiences? Well, most of the baby's experiences, just like most of most animals' experiences, like mammals, are emotional experiences. So the the things that matter to to a baby are they matter because they're emotional and vice versa when when um a feeling of discomfort well that matters because we as babies want to get rid of the discomfort and we, and we want to be fed or we want to be burped or or whatever and and so that there may be a a an intimate relation between those basic emotions and the and the sounds and and maybe like the complexities of sounds in some way are founded on the root of those basic emotional experiences and maybe basic situations that are that are associated with those sounds because there was a video that we that we all watched i think we all watched it of this lady uh, we don't know much about her we i haven't had a chance to look into her who's talking about like baby language right and she looks at babies and she the different kinds of cries that they make mm -hmm. and like the like the yeah yeah is like food or ha huh, is like ooh hot or there's like a different or one that's discomfort uncomfortable and, yeah. right it's like well these are basic experiences of babies and they're they're the only sounds that they're able to vocalize um, because like babies can't differentiate between th and f and like v and you know they they, they can't just say like mummy I'm a little bit hot can you yes. remove my jumper <laughs> right they're, 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 it's not it's not going to work so um, well. I just wanted to throw some of those those ideas out there, like the philosophical foundation for well, the, the root of experience may actually lie in the just the the root experience, which is a feeling of like of like or dislike or like, uh, and then those feelings become more complex um, as as creatures become more complex, and then when we have the most complex creature that we're that we're aware of, like humanity, it's the, we have the most complex experiences at the same time. And our thoughts maybe are, are a reflection of that, but not just that, um, because there's also going to be a spiritual element. But anyways, <laughs> a whole uh, lot of stuff out there. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that when, and this is one thing that I really appreciate about, appreciate about the videos that you did and, and bringing up the subjects that you have, Chu, is the fact that uh, all of this... Uh, is now something that's being entertained in my mind. Like I never really thought about language in in, in this kind of a way before. Like a, uh, just the like I didn't know that that sounds could potentially have meaning. Like that there could be this uh, archetypal um, reference point for each sound. So, but uh, as barrier or bomb or even the silent tomb they all have bees and they all have very similar uh, qualities to them when you when you kind of zoom out a bit uh and so so i really appreciate what you've uh what you've done and kind of like bringing that to the fore and then as you were saying about um thoughts uh, as feelings uh something that i had been thinking about uh, after watching some of your videos too and noticing in myself is simply the fact like when we're having these conversations and there will be something that I want to say that I quite, that I don't quite know how to say just yet. It's like, I go into my mind and there's this abstract thing somewhere mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm feeling the shape of it, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm feeling this, this abstract shape somewhere off in the distance. And I don't know exactly what's going on, mm -hmm. but as soon as I can like feel around, and it's like in my oh, mind space. In my mind space, I, I I get the right feeling or sensation, and then all of a sudden, it, what I'm trying to say uh, springs forth from it. How the bloody hell 
does this make any kind of sense from a evolutionary perspective? Like that, hmm. like you can't, well, that, that's not a thing that, you know, can, can be explained in that way. Well, one, one more quick thing before you respond to, because on, on that subject of like the sounds and even, even that feeling for the shape, um, I wondered about onomatopoeia, like the, like you in one of your videos you mentioned certain sounds and and they did like a, a study where you present two different sounds and say oh well is this more likely to be sharp edged or round or something like that and it seems to me that seems to make intuitive sense to me just from a from an experiential perspective like because in the world even without language when you hear something like like that's a sharp plosive sound right whereas whereas if you're in some kind of like calm environment it's going to be like right so these there's going to be root basic like root emotional experiential associations between certain types of sounds and certain you know emotional experiences right okay well that's a lot um (laughs) sorry um, good thing i'm taking notes um Here's my crazy theory, um, because ultimately you mentioned feelings, you mentioned consciousness, you didn't mention information, but you could have. Um, oh, that was the other thing I was going to mention. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, no, I was just simply no. going to say that uh, that uh, that was kind of what it seemed to be like where that was coming from. Like there's some kind of a- antenna apparatus going on where I'm like able to tap into some kind of field of things, uh, get a, a feel for them. And then that translates into, uh, whatever it is that I'm trying to say. So there does seem to be that, uh, information field connection, but what it is and how it exists and how it interacts with, or how we interact with it. It's kind of a, well, yeah, the, the thing is, all these words, all these concepts, right? Uh, I happen to have a very good friend who is a physicist. And every time I ask him, what's an atom? What's an electron? What's information? What's consciousness? He says, physics doesn't know. So I'm not going to pretend to even get close to the definition. And I never forget what Andrew Lobachevsky says that, uh, you know, we're too close in psychology uh, because we are the, the, stu- the subjects of the study. It's very, very difficult for us to observe ourselves and understand what language is because language is unique to humans so you can't do experiments unless you decide to be a sadist and you know open somebody's brain you're not going to be able to figure it out and we can't observe um ourselves as a whole and there's a lot a lot in science that is not explained feeling maybe it's feeling maybe it's something different depending on the level you're at in terms of consciousness, even though I don't know what consciousness means, but, you know, a plant will feel music, say, and and they like, uh, they've done experiments where like the plant blooms and grows beautifully if it's, if there is, it's listening to classical music, but if you put some techno or whatever, or rap, it goes, right? So there's something about, um, call it information, call it feeling, um, that, I think connects everything, and but that our our own level of uh, perception or consciousness, if you wish, uh, we only get a little piece of that. So when you are, um, by the time it gets to a letter, or it gets to a sound, or it gets to even a thought of yours, in in a broader sense, it could be much much more complex, and we really really don't understand what it is. You know, we may perceive, we may notice these patterns in sounds and in spell, in letters or alphabets or whatever, but what it means in another stage, I think it's going to be impossible at this level of reality to really, really figure out. Um, but there seems to be something akin to an information field in the sense that supposedly a field is something that works at a, di- where there's an action at a distance, right? So one, um, Pushing one um, atom here, one particle here, will have an effect on that one over here, right? Well, you see that all the time uh, in language because um, there's things that, again, are not explained. For example, you have in this, in Southern Europe, 
just to give you an example, you have Spain, you have in the middle of the Basque country, that's a, the Basque language is supposed to be completely different, right? Uh, nobody knows its roots, etc. Then you have further east, you have uh, Greece. Now, those three languages, Spanish, Basque, and Greek, are supposed to be completely different. Mm-hmm. Nothing, they don't have the same, uh, uh, they don't belong to the same families at all. Yet, if you look at their sound systems, they're very similar. And nobody compares those. Nobody says, well, why? Oh, well, maybe because they were close to each other. Well, not really. Greek, to go from Greece to Spain, it's a bit of a trek. Um, Basque, I could understand. Um, But then you have those connections. So almost like a morphogenetic feel like Sheldrake would have uh, talked about. It's like, it's not really in the culture. It's something in the air that makes people uh, group together and choose, for example, certain sounds. Uh, on the other hand, you have languages that are that have many similarities, say with Basque, uh, across the, in the Americas, or okay. Finnish and Basque, and you're like, well, where does that come from? They must have picked it up from somewhere. There's that idea, that constant idea of a, of an information field, because for two peoples who didn't know each other, never interacted with each other, to come up with that similarly complex grammar. I can't even imagine how that would have happened unless they were picking up from somewhere or interacting with, let's call it the information field somehow or other. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's or something. Um... Aliens. Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, at this point, um, yeah. it's just like, you, we can't know these things or not yet. One day science will know, you know, in the 18th century, uh, and earlier, especially with Darwinists, really, uh, people thought that Asian languages, so tonal languages, were primitive because they sounded more like singing, you know? So in Chinese, uh, I just talk, spoke Chinese, right? It sounds like I'm singing a bit. Mm-hmm. They said these people are primitive. They're just, they're all about feelings, speaking about feelings. You know, the Southern people are all about feeling. We are the rational ones. The, the Westerners, especially the Brits, were the rational ones and the, you know, more advanced civilization. Well, now we look at that and we laugh, right? It's ridiculous to think that Asian languages are less complex than, say, English. Well, what is to say that 100 years from now, uh, we're going to look at the theories that are current nowadays about this famous Prometheus that create a language or evolution or whatever, and we're not going to be laughing. There's still a lot, a lot to jump Mm -hmm. to or to learn in order to get a better understanding, I think, of language and thought and and things Mm -hmm. like that. What is sure is that um, the brain alone doesn't explain it. And that's the other debate. Is it brain or is it mind? Mm -hmm. Where is language uh, seated? There's two areas in the brain, especially uh, located in the left hemisphere of the brain that are usually associated with language. You've probably probably heard of uh, aphasia, Broca's aphasia or Wernicke's. Yeah. Um, um, I always confuse them. Wernicke's uh, is the one where the person can uh, can understand everything or can't, no, can't understand words, but they'll talk with correct grammar and they'll, uh, they won't make sense because they forgot the meaning of the words. So yesterday I saw an ashtray flying on the street and you're like, that's a grammatically correct uh, sentence, but it doesn't make any sense, right? That's Wernicke. A lesion in Wernicke's area will make you speak like that. For um, Broca's aphasia, the person won't understand and, uh, and won't be able to speak properly. Um, so, And they'll have a lot of trouble finding definitions. Instead of ashtray, they will say the container, smoke, and they'll struggle, right? So people speculated for a long time that language was seated there, except that there's many, many people who have accidents, cardiovascular or other, into the brain, and then the brain compensates and goes somewhere else, and the person is perfectly able to speak and write and and everything. The second proof is that polyglots, and any specialist for that matter, polyglots use their brain less. They did MRIs on polyglots, people who speak many languages, and they use their brains less than a person with just one a monolingual, a person with one language. Oh, so so where did aren't all that, that language smart, go? They? <laughs> That's what it sounds yeah. like to me. I mean, you think <laughs> if it was a matter of brain, though, you would think that a special uh, um, a doctor in I don't know ob- uh, 
cardiac surgeon or whatever would have a brain like this, right? Yeah. Or yeah. a person who speaks eight languages would have a brain like this. And then 20 goes like that. It's not in the brain. <laughs> I mean, even if you talk about electrical connections and stuff, mm -hmm. not only that, but Neanderthals had bigger brains than we do. So go explain that. They've looked for genes for years and years and years. There was one where they thought they were getting close. It's called FOX2P because there was a family who had a mutation in that gene and they couldn't use grammar correctly. They spoke very, very bad English. So everybody was like, yeah, we found it. It's the gene, it's a language gene. Except again, Neanderthals have it. <laughs> and this family had a lot of cognitive impairment separated from, from language. So there's been probably five decades since they're looking for these genes and they haven't found a single one. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not a materialistic, a tangible thing. I don't think you can put language in the brain. The brain might be like Adam said, an antenna for something mm -hmm. or um, a receptor or the way we, um, we interpret things, the, our interface basically with the non-tangible aspects. Well, before you mentioned uh, the information field, um, which is this non-physical, uh, um, but yet substantial, but on another level, uh, kind of uh, ether or um, or level of uh, of awareness or knowledge that that exists, but not as we not as we normally conceive of. Um, of things existing because we're very materialistic we think of things in terms of three dimensions and things that we can perceive with our hands and our and our five senses and yet um what's being suggested here is that there may in fact be um some access through mind to uh language as information that maybe pre-existed human beings or or we don't know but these seem to be questions that we shouldn't uh outright outrightly dismiss um because we don't really have any other uh any other um anything that that's that's more reasonable um and along those lines um i did a little search before the interview uh, language and intelligent design. And lo and behold, um, one of our, or one of my favorite um, writers on the subject of intelligent design, Perry Marshall, mm -hmm. who is an electrical engineer, um, gave a little talk on this subject too. And, and something he said in getting back to this point about biology, having uh, these interesting parallels to language, uh, he says DNA is a language. And he broke down DNA to a nucleotide, codon, gene, operon, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these correctly, and regulon. And he likened them to, in the human language, uh, characters, letters, words, sentences, and paragraphs. Now, who knows if it's a perfect analogy? I, I don't know. Um, but uh, but his point was, you know, getting back to the, the idea that all languages and codes have these four components. I think for all of us who've discussed and looked at intelligent design before, um, you know, it, it it's it's pretty clear that biology is a, a pretty good example of the idea that uh, we couldn't have just come together. And if if DNA is in fact a language, if it meets the requirements of being a language and the subject of this discussion is language, um, you know, we, we might be able to use everything that you've uh, brought up today and more, I'm sure there are more avenues of, of discussion uh, into um, pointing at least because we can't prove anything, but pointing at least to the idea that that there's something a little more special to language than, than we've been led to think about. Yes, I think it would be very interesting if people actually did comparative studies with the uh, DNA, because you know Marshall is using is using it as an analogy, really, 
Um, but as far as I understand, and I'm not a biologist, uh, people don't really know why languages, why uh, DNA codes the way it does. Like they know it does. They know these um, you know, the letters recombine and, you know, you need three and then you produce the whatever protein you need to produce. But sometimes you the same the code, it, sometimes the same code will produce different proteins. So they don't really know how the language of DNA works as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And, um, and DNA is also seen as an antenna sometimes, or when, if you, they they've done studies where they I believe they put some electromagnetic field uh, beamed at it or I can't remember maybe you guys uh, know what no, I'm I talking about no. and it behave uh, DNA behaved like a fractal antenna so uh, it had nothing to nothing to do with the coding of proteins but they discover a new function of DNA I really couldn't expand on that because I'm really not uh, good at biology but I my point is that. Again, like they, they, it looks clear cut even for genetics, but it's not because there's many things that are even, that aren't even coded in the genes. Like Sheldrake says, you know, mm -hmm. there's no code in your genes for the shape of your nose or your fingers, and yet you inherit it from the, your parents. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. another hint that there's something that glues us together that connects to the information field. I don't know what. Mm -hmm. And with the DNA, I think, yeah, I don't think it, it's exactly like language. Mm -hmm. but it includes design. So why wouldn't language include design or imply design? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the changing subjects a bit, um, bringing it back to like the practicalities of actually speaking languages. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll transition from DNA. So in DNA, we've got the, we've, we've got the, the building blocks, right? And like we mentioned earlier, like you said, the building blocks of language are phonemes and, basic sounds so i was curious before the interview so i just did a quick internet search i this may be this may not be the best updated up-to-date information but i was looking for the number of like the the extremes of phonemes so the language that i found with the fewest phonemes was uh let me see if i can read this uh Roto rotokas from new guinea with 11 mm -hmm. phonemes five vowels and six consonants and that's it and they they even have or it might even be I think they're, I, I saw, it was kind of contradictory. I couldn't quite understand it. I think their alphabet has 11 characters, but actually only 10 sounds or something like that. But then there's the Ta from Botswana, who there were two different or a bunch of different studies that they quoted. And no one really seems to know exactly how many phonemes they have, but it's anywhere from like 80 to 110. Um, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the counts said they have 58 consonants, 31 vowels and four tones and um some of a lot of those consonants are made using i think i can't remember how many clicks might be like 10 different 10, 8 to 11 different types of clicks so you were mentioning there's usually an average of like 20 25 sounds i just wanted to give an idea of the the range so you have you know 10 or 11 on the bottom up to like 100 and something at the top with sounds that of course we're not used to in our in like mo most like non-african languages um so you've got tones that we're not that we don't use at least not functionally in language and then clicks then vowels and consonants so what really one of the things that really for some reason just fascinates me um and you mentioned it i think in the first video of your series is maybe also in one of the other ones just how cool sounds are because like you mentioned we've got something like five vowels um, but there's a, a graphical way of, representa of representing how those vowels sound and to, to show the difference between how different languages, how they sound in different languages. And it has to do, I think, with, maybe you can explain this, like where the, where the tongue is in your mouth, how the air is flowing. And you can have pretty much infinite variations within this space of, within this vowel space. You know, we've got the vowel box and you can just kind of like track on there. And it just, it just so happens that most languages have an ah sound, an e sound, an o sound, but but they but there's room for variation, and the variation is what interests me, um, because, well, like I just said, an ah might sound different in one language from the other. Um, so I, could you just just share whatever thoughts you have on on sounds, but also. Um, does it have, does that have anything to do with, uh, with accents? 
are when you adopt a new accent, are you changing how you actually like pronounce each sound? Like what's what actually is an accent? Okay, so that's two questions in one. Huh? The first yes. is sounds. Um, the sounds, yes, they are kind of infinite, but within the range of our human capabilities. Um, and there's something very interesting also in terms of intelligent design, and is that each of us is said to have a unique voice. Mm -hmm. No voice is identical to the other. So tell me, how is that a random mutation, just like our fingerprints? You know, why would everybody have a distinctive sound? But anyway, that's a parenthesis. Um, Children up to babies up to about eight months old are able to distinguish all sounds of the world. So you play, you know, I, I'll tell you, for example, a difference in, um, I'm saying the, uh, I don't know, let me think, uh, the S, the, um, the uh, P sound in spill is not the same as the P sound in pill. Do you hear it or do you ever think about it? Never thought about that in my life. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, try to say them. Pill, spill. What spill. happened? Pill, spill sounds spill. like a b. Yeah. Pill, spill. <laughs> explain it. Explain it to me. <laughs> what am I doing? Okay. Well, the P, the P is a bilabial consonant. That is, you use uh, both lips and close them, right? And because you do that, you expel air all of a sudden. P. You block the air mm -hmm. and then, right? Uh, but because sounds all modify each other in context, um, the one that's, that comes before will influence the other one. And with S, I already released air. So by the time I get to the P, mm -hmm. I have less air to release. And the P becomes closer to a B. Mm -hmm. It's less airy, if you want, right? So a baby would be smarter than all of us together and would be able to distinguish those tiny, tiny differences. If a baby hears only, say, Italian, but you play uh, Japanese sounds, something happens where the baby recognizes the distinction. And as the baby grows up, uh, there comes a stage talking about imprinting where everything kind of narrows down. And, um, and each of us chose the language, the, the sounds of our mother tongue. To the point where we can't even hear it. the proof. Even in English, you don't hear the the subtleties, mm -hmm. and you need to pay attention, right? Um, I uh, the the ah in Spanish is not the same as the ah in English. Can you hear the difference? Ah ah. Ahora, mm -hmm. just now, and uh... <laughs> it's very subtle, right? Mm -hmm. Well, a baby could tell you that. I mean, the t just a t. Uh, is completely different. T in English, t, t, t in Spanish, t, in Chinese, t, Russian. Did you hear the difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're paying attention, you will. But in general, you, you'll just ignore it. Well, babies are able to do that. So I think that what happens with the different languages, like the one that has very little phonemes or very or a lot, is that I don't know why, but maybe these sounds are needed to represent uh, reality for a certain culture. And each culture will, will choose more richness of sounds, if you want, or, or less of it. But that's not to say it's a, it's a more primitive language if they chose the sounds, because often um, languages who may have, uh, which may have less phonemes also have um, a lot of either tones or clicking sounds or they can even use uh, whispering, uh, and that whispering means something completely different. So whether it's uh, more amplitude in the sound or less amplitude, it changes the meaning. Uh, whether there's a, yeah singing or not, the melody will change. So phonemes, don't let yourself be fooled by the fact that there's few phonemes, because a language may be very, very rich in other ways, too. Mm. Um, there's less vowel, there's, you know, an average amount of vowels in Chinese, but each of them will be influenced by a tone. Ah, mm. ah, ah, ah. That could be said to be a phoneme, right? Four phonemes because they change mm -hmm. the meaning of, of a word. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's complicated. I don't know if I answer your question. Well, that, yeah, that was, I, that, that part wasn't really a question. I just wanted to to hear more oh. about sounds just because I like sounds. But so the actual question was, no, is that, is that related to the, to the different accents? Oh, the accents. Yeah. 
Because like if you, when you're watching movies, even when you're watching actors adopt an accent, right? That you can tell, okay, that person's trying to sound Russian, um, like, or a bad Russian. Yeah. And, and, and when you're listening to someone, or you can like just adopt the character of a of a Russian person, right? Like if I'm putting on a Russian accent, which I won't do now and embarrass myself, you know, there's a there's a what character. are you talking about? <laughs> yes, there's a there's a character, <laughs> and like the the where where the voice is like kind of like gets deeper in my body, and like there's there's a whole there's a whole character that that goes along with that accent. So, but I just want to know what is that what what accounts for for that like what are people actually doing with are they are they changing the um is it and i'm not i'm not i'm not so much just interested in accents um just the the idea of these different types of sounds how much how much of it is an aspect of the way they're changing like where the voice is or are they are are we actually if we're adopting a new accent are we trying to um to ch- to 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 adopt those different vowel sounds or those different consonant sounds. Um, what are all of those things that just go into languages sounding different, even if they're using technically very similar phonemes, right? You can write it out in mm-hmm. the, you could write out, oh, this is how you pronounce this word in this language. And then an English person pronounces it using those, that phonetic chart, right? And then it sounds like an English person pronouncing this, this foreign word. Like what, what gives languages mm-hmm. their, their color like that? In your experience, well, I think one, one, one could be one reason could be cultural. Like I said before, whatever they collectively chose to uh, to use sounds for or specific sounds for, there's a, there are, there's also a very um, the I call it the fashion factor uh, because you know like for example English has become cool to use in many countries and uh, and you hear. I don't know, Koreans, for example, that imitate Americans and they will be saying, sorry, you know, very, very exaggerated. Like no American would say sorry, but it sounds American to them. Right. So um, there's that there's that imitating what you perceive from the culture Mm -hmm. and adopting it sometimes for your culture. Uh, There's also the fact that I think um, it's very personal to you. Uh, accent in general. And that's why it's easy for people to learn the grammar of a language when they start learning a foreign language pretty well, but it's difficult to learn subtleties and meaning. And it's difficult to learn the sounds because the sounds are basically what we are, what we have from the womb, from what we have from that period of imprinting. So it's very difficult to get rid of it. And, and a lot of people even say that it, if you adopt a foreign accent, you lose your identity in a sense. Hmm. I, I agree with it to a certain extent. And it happened to me when I was learning French to the point where I was like, gee, I'm being more French than the French uh, because I was imitating them and trying to put myself in their minds and say, I, damn it, I'm tired of being called a foreigner or, or asked where I'm from. I'm going to pretend I'm French. And I managed, but by putting myself like into the, immersing myself so much into the culture that I thought like I was losing myself. It's true. So I, I can say it's true to a certain extent, but ultimately it isn't. You can have whatever accent you want. You can, you can master the language as much as you want and you'll still be you. But I think there's an intrinsic fear in that. In many people, you see it a lot in, a lot in immigrants. Any migrating community usually will keep a certain specific accent, right? Well, maybe, maybe, the, uh, maybe the accent... And the mentality, as you described it, you are, are like training wheels, mm-hmm. you know, where it's a, um, it just kind of eases the process along. You're getting into the the headspace of, uh, in a certain sense, whatever language uh, you're you're trying to learn. Yeah. Well, there's training wheels, but there's also like the whole, an accent is not just the sounds, right? It's the music. Mm-hmm. Like you said, if I were to imitate a Russian man, you wouldn't be focusing on the sounds. You would be focusing on the melody of that, mm-hmm. of that language. Mm-hmm. No, I'm a Rush. I'm, it, I'm Italian. You know <laughs> who, what I can tell you. Yes. I don't know the sounds of Italian, but you, just from the music, you heard Italian, right? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I, it's very interesting that you mentioned that because I was just having a conversation uh, today or yesterday with a friend of mine. And I said, if there was one language I would have loved to have learned, it's, it's Italian. Because to my ears, 
it is the most beautiful sounding language that I, I have heard. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I, maybe because I also like to talk with my hands, it be, it's, it's attractive to me, <laughs> but, um, I, I wonder if there is a, um, you know, like there are certain proportions and certain rules that make things beautiful. Maybe there are certain, and this might be off the beaten path a little bit, but maybe there are certain sounds that, like you were saying, are more melodious or are more aesthetically, uh, you know, there's a reason why a lot of opera is in Italian. Uh, there's a reason why it's considered the, you know, the, aside from German, the, the language of choice in opera, uh, which is an art. Um, so that's more just of a comment than, than it is a, it a could question. Be. It could be. I mean, <clears throat> to me, vowels are the most melodious ones. So I like languages that have a lot of vowels and, and melody, like Chinese. That's why I always love Chinese, because of the melody. Like you say, it's a, that's that's called prosody, the rhythm, the melody, the, the uh, intonation. Um, you have it a lot in English. You just don't realize. Huh? But if yeah. you say, uh, I don't know. I want, I want to go to the cinema is not the same as I want to go to the cinema, mm. right? You just change mm. the music of the, uh, of the sentence. And that's very personal, I think. And that's what you hear the most in accents. Sometimes it's in the phonemes and it's very particular because our, our, our sound system is a bit like a, imagine a colander, right? When you were a baby, you had all the holes available to you, the poo and the in spill and in the pill, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you ended up with 10 or 12. So to open that up again, to hear and yeah. pronounce the difference between the Russian T and the English T, you have to make a very big effort as an adult mm -hmm. to expand that. So it's a bit of, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, a mixture of, I don't want to because I lose my identity. And it's also objectively mm -hmm. hard to do. Yeah. Like I was, um, there's, there was a TV show called the Americans about Russian spies in america who adopt american personalities or american just identities and one of the criticisms that i read of, of the show at the time was that well yeah these like this program did exist but they wouldn't be able to like adults you can't integrate yourself and totally adopt an american personality you're going to still have a russian accent right and um yeah and, and it escapes mm -hmm. It, when you're when the person is tired, for example, I mean, yeah. even when I was making one of the videos, I'll confess that one part that I wanted to delete because I got so confused talking about Chinese and Russian that I that suddenly the H became the Spanish H. So I say, if you have <laughs> if you have this or that, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm embarrassed. Uh, that happens to everybody. It's like you're tired. Yeah. Your mother tongue takes over. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and these actors imagine that stress they're under and whatever, as much as they try, there's always a little clue there that is not their mother tongue. There's exceptional cases where re you really can't tell. But for the most part, even yeah. the best polyglots, you're like, I yeah. know who, which the mother tongue is. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. There's a I can't remember his name. He's a guy, a young guy. Well, I think he's like 30 years old in New York um, who is fluent in Chinese. He studied Chinese, but he, one of the things he does is that he learns a new language for a, a limited amount of time. Like he'll try to, to learn as much of a new language as possible in one day or in one month. So the last one I, I saw, I watched, I, I haven't watched very many of his videos, but the last one I saw was he learned Navajo in the American Indian language in a, he studied it for a month and then went to, um, like a Navajo reservation or area and just went and started talking to people and and the, of course the the all the elders the 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 older individuals who who knew the language because a lot of the young ones don't don't they don't want to learn it um they were of course they they loved the fact that they could that he could speak it and they showed him all kinds of stuff brought it was like lockdown but they but they brought him into the restaurant and showed him how to make like traditional navajo foods and stuff but um but he's an example of one of those guys where um seems to have that talent for it and that that ability to 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 represent that la a language extremely well like uh he i've seen he, him talking to to chinese people where they're amazed at his accent that he if they're if they're i think he even there there are a couple people that i've seen on uh, on on youtube who who in who might play video games or something interacting with chinese people and they can't tell that that he's american because he's he's like so mastered the the accent but 
that seems to be just one of those, um, to a large degree, a talent, right? Just like maybe music for some is a talent. Um, well, basically not everyone would be able to do that. There might, some might be able to work really hard for it, but some, it might come a bit more easier than others. And it's just, it's just, it, I find it again, just a, a really fascinating thing that, uh, that, uh, a, a fascinating human ability. Yeah, I guess you could say the same about everything. Each of us is good at something or better mm -hmm. at something, but mm -hmm. sometimes we forget the amount of training we had, even if it's just in the focus, we, the time we invest in a specific uh, set of skills. Huh? I mm -hmm. mean, I'm good with sounds too. And I had those experiences like in China on the phone and it, uh, I was talking, I'm like, no, really, I don't speak good enough Chinese to, to tell, to explain to you what I want to know. And the person was like, if you're not Chinese, I'm Brazilian. And they would hung up and they would be like, you're being rude, you know? So it was a curse, but I wouldn't say I'm gifted for that, you know, uh, because I put a lot of effort into it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it's like, you know, an engineer who's, who sees the whole world as little machines and hydraulics or something. And, uh, and a doctor who sees people, you can't help it when it's in your field, in your passion mm -hmm. or your, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, gifted mm -hmm. people. Yeah, sure. There's, there's people who have more facility for something than others, but, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to sound, I think it's also a lot of training and maybe, um, a little bit of flexibility to, yeah. um, to enter into that other world or to enter into that, uh, that other culture that goes mm -hmm. for learning languages in general, I think. And it's also even cultural to begin with, because there's countries where being trilingual is the norm. Uh, for you guys in the U.S., it's not so common, right? No, you backwards uh, Americans. <laughs> well, it's it's logical in a sense because, uh, well, Americans in general are probably told, you know, everybody speaks English in the world, and say it in the, English. Yeah, say it in English. What's the purpose, right? But um, I know people in Denmark, for example, who are so little, so they, they tell you in the streets, you know, I, I ask people, why do you speak so, such good English? Well, we're so minuscule, only 4 million or now 5 million people in Denmark. We better learn English mm. or we'll be eaten by <laughs> the empire, you know? So, um, yeah, it depends. And th then again, you don't see that some people, some cultures are more talented for language than others. It's also that it's been instilled into them or children mm -hmm. who are born from bilingual parents, even though the, the parents don't speak each other's language, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that was it's innate, uh, it's complex. Yeah. Uh, just as a, an interesting anecdote, um, there was one trip that I made to France where I was stuck in an airport because uh, one of the flights got delayed. And so uh, I was stuck there. Um, I believe I was in Amsterdam at the time or no, no, uh, I was, I was in France at the time waiting to go to, uh, Amsterdam for my layover. And so it was me and a group of six, uh, six women who were, uh, from who were Danish. And so they were all, uh, we were all standing together and one, I started asking one of the women, like, you know, do, do you know what's going on? Because I noticed that she spoke English. So I started talking to her and then the other women that were around her, well, then they started uh, speaking in English. And so it was just like me and this group of, you know, set six older Danish women who were speaking English. And then, you know, we figured out what was going on. And uh, so I just kind of like, you know, left the group for a little bit and they continued talking in English for a good like five or 10 minutes before one of the women was like, why are we speaking in English? <laughs> <laughs> and then they went right back into the mother tongue. Uh, and so that was that was really interesting to me that it was that they, it, it was just so comfortable for them. It was just so normal for them that they were able to do it amongst themselves without ever realizing it. And I noticed it with some of my coworkers because a couple of my coworkers speak Russian. And so they'll be talking to each other in Russian and then they'll roll over into speaking in English and then they'll roll back into, into Russian. And it seems like there's no rhyme or reason to it to me, but it's, it's just this, this, you know, this flowing stream of consciousness that, you know, makes sense, I guess. But, uh, it's just really cool that that this is some kind of skill that you can develop uh, and some kind of like aspect of of 
who we are and like what we can do that, you know, you can do this like really cool thing where you can start a conversation in English and then roll it into French and then roll it into Russian and then roll it into Chinese and then roll it back into English for no other reason than like, you know, you like how saying something uh, in one language and then you like being able to say something else in another language. Italian's better for this next yeah. sentence. <laughs> well, sometimes that's true. Or if you're more familiar, if you read more, say, in French about a certain topic, you'll be more comfortable talking about it in French than in uh, than in English or whatever. That's very, very common. Um, they don't know, actually, how language switching happens. That's it's also a bit of a mystery. For some people, it's a matter of frequency. And I myself experienced that it depends on the level. So when I first started uh, learning Russian um, and I switched back, I went to a Chinese store and I wanted to speak Chinese with the owner and I just couldn't bring myself to speak Chinese, uh, Rus uh, Chinese. Yeah, sorry. I kept saying da da instead of sure in Chinese, completely different. huh? So it was a matter of <laughs> level almost for me. Once I went higher in Russian to be able and was able to have a normal conversation, then I stopped dissociating them. I stopped mi uh, mixing them. Sorry. And I started dissociating them. I don't know why it happens and I don't have much of a problem switching between French, Spanish, and English, for example. But I know many learners who, if they usually recommend that you get to a certain level in one language and then start the other, otherwise you're going to mess them up. Mm. Even though they're completely different, huh? like Chinese and Russian. I don't know why I did it. And so there's that. There's, uh, there's many mysteries. I think the funny thing is that we've been talking and talking about this and we always take language for granted. Mm hmm and yet we all have a story to tell about language. We all use language. Without language, we wouldn't be human. So to me, the, the whole topic is fascinating because it brings me back to even asking, why are we here? You know, who are we? What do we, what do we need to learn? Why language and not another means of communication? Um, why is it that as humans, as advanced as we are compared to other animals, uh, still have a lot of trouble understanding each other. Mm. And I'm not talking about different languages, but between ourselves, you know, or having, uh, like Adam de described earlier, we have trouble expressing, putting things into words. You know, if we're these super advanced uh, beings, why is it that we need language to learn certain lessons? You know, you learn when you finally figure out how to express a feeling with words and process it in your mind or with a friend or whatever. Um, you learn, right? And language allowed you to do that. It's like a tool for our reality um, to grow, to do so many mm -hmm. things, and yet we don't understand it. We don't even know how to define it. Um, it's one of, to me, it's one of the most beautiful mysteries uh, in the world. Of, I know I'm biased, but <laughs> I think it compares to biology and history and everything. Um, yeah, and I think it should be studied a lot more because it, it, I don't know, to me, it's like a clue about how to define ourselves and how to even be better. Um, Alan, you mentioned the, uh, the corruption of language nowadays, and I think it's tragic because just as accents, pronouns, for example, are very personal to each culture and each, um, each person. And when you start changing that, uh, by force, like Esperanto, there's no soul to it. There's no real, uh, you know, meaning to it. So you could create it. A, you could be creating a bit, um, a big problem, psychologically speaking, or or in in that. Mm. What are we here for? And that why you, why do we need language? You know, uh, and when they start using double speak or changing definitions, you know, suddenly a pandemic is not what it used to be, and things like that it scrambles your brain and it, it does something to your brain. And if it does something to your brain, then language is not your friend. Language can be your best friend for learning, or it can be the best weapon of destruction in a way, mm -hmm. if it can affect your thinking and, and your uh, reasoning and the way you communicate with others, the people you relate to, the, the cultures you hate or don't. Uh, so it's very problematic because it's one of our main strengths, but it can also be our main uh, one of our main weaknesses. And I think that's why neutral language is uh, becoming more popular in in the United States and in countries 
where the languages are gen are have no the words have no gender, like Danish, Swedish, because it's very easy to uh, to change little things here and there and affect the language from the deeper uh, psychological point of view. It's much easier to do it in English than it is to do it in Spanish, where you would have to change the entire sentence just to use Z. You would have to change the ending for Z um, person. Person will have to change the ending. Is uh, nice, will have to change the ending. You have to change the entire grammar of the language just to add those. English, however, it's a lot more vulnerable in that respect. So identity politics is a lot more difficult to uh, to brainwash in Spanish. Well, it's still coming and they're still doing it. Huh? Yeah. Uh, but what's curious, I'll give you a bit of trivia. I don't know if you'll be interesting. Um, the fact is that genders weren't genders to begin with. There's more and more proof that genders um, meant originally that something was collective or individual. So, for example, in Spanish, you have um, uh, madero is one log for the fire. One log. Madera is wood, plural. Right? So uh, it has nothing to do with gender. It's all about the, uh, the meaning collective or singular, which is still present, for example, in Chinese. You, you use certain classifiers to say this is one thing or this is many things. And then later on, a grammarian came along and said, let's call this the feminine or the masculine. The A is feminine, the O is masculine, or the, uh, in other languages, it will change. You have neuter, for example. But those are conventions. They're not, there's got nothing to do with the gender. For poetry, yes. For me, a moon is feminine. So I'm used to reading in Spanish poetry about how the moon is sensual and dances in the night, blah, blah, blah. For a German, the moon is masculine. So they'll probably make a poem about the moon being a heroic soldier right hmm. but that's just poetry it's got nothing to do with gender at a deeper level i don't think of uh, democracy because it's feminine as a girl and you see what i mean it's ridiculous to see it as a gender ide uh, identity or so that's why i think gender neutral stuff is either not going to work or it's going to mess up things really bad well i think um okay. did you have a, a Something I was just going to say, I mean, unless there was anything else uh, we wanted to ask or comment on show uh, folks to this is a, a great conversation. And um, it just so happened in case anybody's wondering that uh, I was coming to visit and in the area and uh, it coincided with our uh, our wanting to talk to you. And I'm, I'm very pleased that we had this uh, opportunity to because uh, like Adam uh, was saying earlier, it was uh, you know, this is really opening up a lot of uh, avenues of, of thought and, and perspectives that we may have not even considered before. So thank you so much, Chu, for taking this time to chat about this. Thank you all. It really helps because I'm just at the beginning of this, uh, this endeavor. So it helps to think about it and explain. And I hope uh, you all help me figure it all out in the end. Great. And we'll include in the show notes a link to, uh, to your channel and the, and the series that we talked about. Thank you. Yes. Sounds good. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.